we have with us our Tennessee poet Le laureate uh, who is our dear friend she is so down to earth and loving and um, lovely to have her uh, here today and you will enjoy her talk um, so here she is Maggie Vaughn thank you so much for inviting me I love to see old friends Jeff and I go back how many years honey yeah at least oh lord that's why I got gray hair I guess but um, he, he and I had a mutual friend, Will Mills, and the three of us used to argue over poetry all the time because I'm a country poet. And sometimes I don't understand what they write, but that's okay. They're great writers. Um, I just, country music gave me my voice to write. When I was um, five years old, well, actually before that, but five years old, I, I heard it. I mean, it touched me. Um even though I don't like to talk about divorce and all that, uh, I understood it. And, and it, it, I, through the years, I, I wrote it. And um, in the 60s, I came to Nashville. I was born in Murfreesboro, grew up in Gulfport, Mississippi. My daddy was a fireman and killed on duty. When I was nine months old, Mom was expecting my little brother. And she married an older man, I'm sure for security. And he was transferred to Gulfport, Mississippi, which I'm so thankful for because Murfreesboro, a girl was supposed to do three things, graduate from high school, get married, and have babies. And I knew I wanted to graduate, but that was the only one I wanted to do at the time because my, my, I was into country music. When I could touch that radio dial, uh, I listened to country music. I, I thought it was some of the greatest poetry I'd ever heard in my life. And... Therefore, I, my, it gave me my voice to write. I tell young poets all the time when they come to see me, find your voice. That's so important, to find your own voice. So um, they wanted me to talk today about songwriting, which is country music for me, and poetry. Now, I'm going to start with Hank Williams, senior. I, I know old junior, but senior was the one of the greatest poets I think that's ever lived. I call him the Shakespeare of country music. One of his songs was, um, I'm so lonesome I could cry. And I want to give you a few lines from that. Um, Hear that lonesome whippoorwill, he sounds too blue to fly. The midnight train is whining low, I'm so lonesome I could cry. God, you, you see those images, you see? Um, and that in the same song, I'm just repeating this one song. I've never seen a night so long as time goes dragging by. The moon just went behind the clouds to hide, hide his face and cry. Did you ever see a robin weep when leaves begin to die? That means he's lost the will to live. I'm so lonesome I could cry. The silence of a falling star lights up a purple sky. And as I wonder where you are, I'm so lonesome I could cry. God, I mean, he had a third-grade education, Hank Williams did. I mean, the silence of a falling star. You see it, but you don't hear it when you, when you see a falling star. And um, he was born in 1923 and died in uh, 1953. He lived to be 29 years old. When I was in school, especially high school, I knew I was going to be a country music writer. And uh, my English teacher was saying, Oh, how can you listen to all those old double negatives? And you know what I said? I said, well, now let's see. Now, this is in the 50s. I said, let's see. Now, you make between thirty-five and four $4,000 a year. Those old double negatives make those country music singers a half million to a million dollars a year. So don't be critical of it, you know. I knew then I was going to be a writer, especially country music. And I started writing uh, years before I ever got published. Um, L Loretta Lynn, I was uh, the Wilburn Brothers. I don't know if you remember the Wilburn Brothers on the Grand Ole Opry. They're, they're all dead except Loretta. Um, said, Maggie, you're one of the strongest lyrics writer that's ever been in country music. 
and we're going, but you can't write a melody. Loretta says, I just have one. I just speed it up and slow it down. And um, I said, you're right. And they said, well, we got a girl coming to town uh, that we're going to sign, and we're going to put you two together to write. And uh, they said, she's got a song in the charts right now. And I said, oh, well, what's that song? And they said, Honky Tonk Girl. I said, oh, that's Loretta Lynn. And I used to be backstage at the Ryman every Saturday night with them. And that next Saturday night, uh, she got into town on Thursday, and she came up to me and she said, I'm Loretta Lynn, and I understand you're Maggie Vaughn. I said, yes. And she said, we're supposed to write together. And I said, yes, and I can't wait. And we wrote, to, we're still writing, although she's gotten on up in age, and I have too, and with the COVID and everything, it kind of, everybody's staying in, and I fell and broke my ankle in about four places, and I don't walk good anymore, so... But it hasn't stopped my brain. Uh, I tell young writers come to me all the time, and older ones too, find your voice. That's the most important thing is finding your voice. And like I say, I found mine in country music. And I've been lucky. Um, I've had songs recorded, several, a lot of them by Loretta and um, Conway Twitty, Ernest Tubb. Oh, different ones in the business, and Stonewall Jackson, and um, and I wouldn't take anything from my voice. Uh, it's it's mine, and I write. I still write, um, and um, I don't know. It, the, the country music can turn a phrase like you won't believe. I mean, that song. It was always so easy to find an unhappy woman till I started looking for mine. I mean. Country music, the, the, they're novels in 12 lines. They sum up a novel. And um, just the way they can turn a phrase and say something. And that's my voice. Um, I, like I say, um, country music started up in the Appalachians, folk songs, people, hard times, coal miners. Um, and they, in the summertime, they'd sit on the porch and sing. And in the winter, they moved into the living room. The living room had one picture on the wall, on a tar paper wall, of usually the Lord's Supper. They, but they t told stories in their songs. And it traveled from there toward Nashville, Tennessee. And in 1925, the Grand Ole Opry, it wasn't called Grand Ole Opry then, it was country music. And um, the solemn old judge was the announcer. And the, the Grand Ole Opry was followed an opera out of New York. They were playing classical music. And George Hayes said, well, tonight you've heard, you know, Grand Ole Opry. Tonight you're going to hear Grand Ole Opry. And that's when the name Grand Ole Opry stuck. And people like Loretta Lynn and, uh, oh my goodness, the way they can turn a phrase to, it's just, it tells, in 12 lines, it, it's a, it's an outline for a novel. And um, I, I, my voice trained to that, and I wouldn't take anything for it, um, for country music. And I write country. And um, Roy Acuff, uh, years ago, put out a song called The Great Speckled Bird. Everybody wanted to know what the great speckled bird was. Well, it was the Bible. And he mentions it, but they didn't hear that. Um, on the wings of the great speckled bird. And I'll never forget um, Jimmy Rogers. Uh, oh, my goodness. He was one of the first. Uh, my father was a fireman and killed on duty. And when I was nine months old, Mom was expecting my little brother. She married an older man, I'm sure, for security a few years later. And um, he was transferred to Gulfport, Mississippi. And I'm thankful for that because in Murfreesboro at that time, a girl was supposed to get married and have babies, like I said. And um, Gulfport was wide open. Uh, they didn't care if you went to church on Wednesday night or not. They didn't have a prayer meeting, I don't think. I was a Methodist. And, um, but it, was a, it turned my whole world around. And I was only five years old. But it was so liberal, and I used to think 
uh, um, when we first got there and I looked out over the beach and they had those skimpy bathing suits on. At the time, they were considered skimpy. And I thought, oh, my Aunt Martha could see this because she thought it was a sin for a girl and boy to be in the same swimming hole together because of bathing suits. And I thought, well, she'd have a fit. And I, I thought, you know, she didn't approve of the swimming hole together and um, thought they were almost naked and said, go down and jump between Zuppo and Biloxi. They were naked on the on the beach. When, so I, I grew up in a hurry and uh, I saw every world. And, you know, you go 50 or 60 more miles to New Orleans and they were naked, uh, uh, sure enough. The strippers, Lord, strippers going down the street and everything. I just, I, it opened up my world from that real conservative Murfreesboro thinking, which uh, I, I didn't participate in anything real bad, but I got pretty close. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I tried to see it all, and I did see it all. Um, so, you know, you grow up in a hurry sometimes when, when you see things like that, but you don't criticize it. Um, but it gave me my voice to, to write what I write. Years ago, um, I was in Nashville for a year to write songs, and I went back to Gulfport and came back four years later to permanently write. And um, this the Chester's store downtown, I don't know if ladies remember that in Nashville, they, uh, it was a very exclusive woman's store, and my aunt worked there. And um, Chester, who owned it, knew I needed work because I was there for a year just to write. And he said, um, Maggie, I'm opening up a store half of Kroger's. They're building a Kroger's on Nolensville Road. Will you run the other half, not the groceries? You don't know anything about groceries or anything, but said, I'm putting like seconds and sell clothes and things in there. And I said, sure, I could use the money, you know. So um, I was in there uh, one evening, when well, all of a sudden, this boom in my brain went. And I have those sometimes, just explosions. And I sat down and I wrote 12 recitations on paper bags. I love recitations. They, they just say so much. And they were all about mama. Um, honey, you want to come up here and play something? Um, I just wrote them. And I stuck them away for for years. And several years ago, uh, a friend of mine, who's, her husband was Dolly Parton's producer, and uh, also Melissa Manchester from out in California. And um, she said, where are those? Did I knock it over? No. Okay. Um, she said, where are those poems that you did you talk about sometimes? I said, I have no idea. So we searched and searched and found them. And she said, we got to put it out. And I said, honey, I don't have the money to put this out. So she said, I'm going to the Tennessee Arts Commission. Well, I had been traveling to, for them uh, to schools and things speaking. And um, at the time, I can't remember the man who was head of it. And she goes there, and she said, um, she spoke to the head man. Usually you had to fill out a lot of paperwork for a grant and all that. But she thought, well, I'll go talk to him. And she said, um, I've got somebody. I want to put a CD out on them. They're poems that she wrote or recitation type thing years ago. And I want to apply for a grant. And he said, well, who is it? Who, you, who is this person? And they said, Maggie Vaughn. He said, oh, you don't have to fill out any papers. He just opened up his drawer, pulled out a checkbook, wrote a check for $5,000 right there to put it out. And uh, so I'm tell I tell young people all the time, go for it. Just go for it. And don't expect anything. Just when It'll come along. It, it's, I made a living doing this. Um, well, I'll be 84 in July, and I was 42 when I moved to Bell Buckle, and I haven't worked. I mean, I just, I write, and I've been able to make it. 
Um, so you you just just go for it. Uh, I see some of you in here with gray hair like mine, and you've already been for it, evidently. So, <laughs> but but I tell young children all the time: find your place, find your voice if you want to be a writer, or whatever you're going to be, find it and be proud of it. So I I went in and uh, years later with my paper bags, and I didn't have any money. And they were doing sessions before mine of some of the big grind old Opry people and everything, and I was waiting to have my turn to go into the studio. And I'll never forget, there was a saxophone player there. And um, he said, I'm, I'm going to stick around and hear you. And I said, oh, you're not going to like mine after what all you've been through. And he said, oh, I want to hear it. So I did did one, one of the recitations. And he said, I've got to be on your session. I've got to be on it. I said, honey, I can't afford you. He said, I'm not charging you a dime. So you see, again, you never know in life what's coming along. Minnie Pearl was like a second mother to me. When I moved to Bell Buckle, my mother nearly had a stroke. She just couldn't understand me giving up a career. I was with the Tennessee and Banner in their advertising department in Nashville at the time. And she said, are you crazy? You've got... Retirement, benefits, Social Security, everything. And Mama, we were poor. I said, Mama, I can't, I can't do this any longer. I gotta go for it. And Lord, she didn't speak to me for months. But many Pearl, like a second mother, said, Go for it, Maggie. You can do it. And she stood behind me until the day she died. And um, so I went in and I did a CD years ago. Now. <laughs> My voice has dropped, of course. People say, well, Maggie, that doesn't sound like you. And I said, well, I recorded it before my breast fell. <laughs> Only I didn't use the word breast. I used the T word. But since we're on, since we're on microphone, I won't say titty. Um, so I'm going to, let's see. These are recitations. Let me see what I want, which one. Let's see. Um, well, I... Uh, Play, um, you got the first one. You got the first one in? I'll, I'll play two then. Um, um, the tranquilizer, I think that's on the that's on the first one. The first one, okay, put on tranquilizer. Which one number is that? I don't know. The five, number five, yeah. Is it five? Yeah, okay. if you're my age, all the mamas in the 40s and 50s, especially the 50s, took tranquilizers. They, every one of them. Mom, honey, had a suitcase full. It's because we'd run through the house, you know, and um, so this one's got some humor to it. Uh, you got it? I think I've got it. It's, okay. If it's number five, I've got it. Number five. Okay. But most of these are pretty serious. This is a funny one I did. <laughs> Mama reached up and took the tranquilizer. In this modern day and age, the tranquilizer is the rage. And though you may not believe it's such, for most mothers it's a crutch. Yes, it's this miracle drug I feel when most mothers take a pill. When I was out on a date and Mama thought it was getting late, she would hear an ambulance shrill. Mom reach up and take a pill. And when she decided to rest a while, and we'd run through like something wild, on the new rug chocolate would spill. Mom reach up, and take a pill. Tranquilizer, tranquilizer. Mama reached up and took a tranquilizer. Oh, she'd get so upset with us, but she never did it, I know. And my brother and I would find some door to stand behind, because we always knew when it was pill time. And I'll never forget one day when the mama looked up in her usual way and said, Now that college I've put you through, what will you be able to do? Nothing, I guess, Mom. There are not many openings in my... You reached up, took a pill. Well, Mama reached up and took a 
Oh, but now the house is quiet once more. There's no more slamming of that old door. Since my brother and I are out on our cell, Mama's pills stay on the shelf. Well, that's a humorous one. Most of them were real sad. Uh, I did something for comic relief. But Mama took tranquilizers. Uh, like I say, they all did uh, when I was growing up. Um, and like I say, I just wrote these things, just do, 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 you know, just like that. It, it, if you get inspired to do something, just get it right there before you lose it. And I got fired because people were walking out with merchandise and I wasn't waiting on them. You know, they fired me the next day. I didn't care. I had my paper sacks. That's all it meant to me. Um, how about, um, uh, um, how, won't you do, um, number six? Just go to the next one. Like only yesterday, I could hear Mama say, We're going to have our own home soon, one with a fireplace in every room. And Mama tried to save for better days, but it's hard when there's kids to raise. Somehow, every nickel she saved, we spent while we did good to pay the rent. But as always, God provided a way for Mama got her new mansion today. No, we never did get to buy that home. It took all our money just to get a loan. You see, Dad had passed away years ago, and she had to be a father also. And when she did save a little, why it would never fail. One of us would step on a rusty nail. Mama used to laugh and say with cheer she'd put the doctor's daughter through school last year. But as always, God provided the way. Mama got her new mansion today. I know there's a fireplace in every room. And she finally got a garden where a rose would bloom. And the company she keeps, a loved one she once knew. I'm sure the master drops in on her too. Yes, it's always God provided the way. For Mama got her new mansion today. Kills me to hear them, honey, because I lived them. Um, well, anyway, years ago, put that CD out. There's two of them in there. And um, got the grant to do them. And they sold out immediately, just immediately they were gone. And I don't know how many thousand they did. I mean, it was something for me, honey. It helped me for a while. And um, after they sold out, I, I had a couple I had saved back. Then about, oh, maybe six months ago, we were going through some boxes and things. I was unpacking where I had been living and had stuff still packed up. And I found another box of them. And I was so glad because um, I've got some. I brought some even with me today. But um, I love doing this. It's all recitations. And it's, it's that old country stuff. And this is all about mamas. Except the second one's got some other things on it. Um, got one called Cinderella and Mickey Mouse. We're alone in this old house. You know, about um, when you got got your toys from your youth that you're going to cross. And my most requested poem, and it's on number two. Um, it's number six, but we won't play it yet. Um, it's my most requested poem. And again, it's about mama. People just, they want to hear about their mama, you know. And I I can write a deeper poem. You know, I've got some that pretty deep, but they're not real deep. 
you, they're what I call wade ins. You know, you wade in them. Um, because people, my audience wants to hear things they understand. They don't want to have to go to a dictionary. They want to be able to hear and they want to relate to it. Again, country music became so popular because everybody related to it. Uh, Cheating Heart, oh my goodness. Hank, like I say, Hank Williams Sr., he didn't buy a millionaire because he spent all his money drinking. But um, he he was big. And um, someone asked one time, said, what's country music? And Harlan Howard said, um, it's three chords. Uh, and it is. It's one, five, four chord. Now, they've gotten fancy now. I don't know if any of you watched the country music CMA Awards the other night. I turned it off. I watched about 30 minutes of it and turned it off. It's no longer country. It's it's that hand-waving and jumping up and down. Well, honey, you didn't jump up and down for Hank Williams. You listened. And he had something to say. Cheating hard. Oh, my God. Used to, you know, they'd go to the taverns. They don't have taverns much anymore. Um, we said did. I'd go to one <laughs> when I'm blue. But um, they'd be in there and they'd head be down my, my wife or my husband left me and they'd be drinking and everything, you know. And all of a sudden, someone dropped a dime in the jukebox. Back then, it was a dime or a nickel. And Hank Williams Sr. came on. You're cheating hard. We'll tell on you. Oh, man. They'd hear that. They'd raise up their head and say, by God, they're going to get theirs. It, they related to it, see. they That's country music. Lord Loretta Lynn, uh, you relate to everything she writes. And the old country, you, Born to Lose. Mm -hmm. Melissa Manchester. I don't know if you're familiar with Melissa. Melissa's a pop singer from Hollywood. Matter of fact, Dolly Parton and Melissa gave me reviews. They're the two that reviewed this and gave me wonderful reviews on it. But Melissa, I said, Melissa, you need to record Born to Lose. And she used to come to Bell Buckle a lot because a friend of mine was the producer. And she said, well, I'll tell you what, Maggie, if you'll sing it, I'll record it. And I thought, oh, Lord, that'll ruin it right there for her, you know. And I never got it to her. And one day I'll try to get it to her, but born to lose. Oh, my God. I mean, the the music, it was, it was earth. Jimmy Rogers was a brakeman on the train. You know, he was the one of the first. He lived in from Meridian, Mississippi, all around the railroad track, waiting for a train. Oh my! People went nuts, and and um, when they when it first came out, you see, um, the radio went clear channel. Did I mention that? I didn't mention that, did I? About the, in nineteen twenty six, um, the Grand Ole Opry was. Uh, Uncle Dave Macon said, I told you that about Grand Ole Opry. Well, it went, and years and years ago, that uh, all the radio signed off at about 5.30 or 6. And when the sun went down, all radios went off. Well, people up in the mountains, Pennsylvania coal miners and all that, they didn't have any entertainment. There was no television, of course, and there was no radio. So years years ago, the FCC granted a certain amount, six or eight radio stations across America, clear channel. It means they could go at night. And WSM was one of them. And that's where the Grand Ole Library was, or the country music at that time. And um, now here's an old farmer or, or coal miner up in Pennsylvania somewhere. And... All of a sudden, he turns the knob on, and it's the Grand Ole Opry. And you're cheating hard. We'll tell on you. And he goes, maybe his wife just left him. Well, I didn't know he that that man knew me. You know, they re, they related to it, and that's why country music is so big. They're poets. Those those songs are poetry. Um, if you go back and listen to them. The stuff today's not, but it was. I mean, they told a story. 
and I train my voice to it. I'm going to play you my most requested poem. It, I recorded it years ago, and it's it's I put it in a book, but honey, this one is, this is what they want to hear. They don't want to hear me anything, do anything too deep. They want this. It's uh, on the second one. I think it's number. I'm so blind. Um, yeah, it's number six on the second CD. What do you need? Oh, it's in there. Okay, well, I'll keep talking. Um, like I say, this book right here, um, I, I can't keep it in. Um, I don't know. I just, I just write. You know, I don't even think about it sometimes. It just comes out on paper. Um, I used to jot things down in the night, but I got too old. And I, um, you know, I don't do that anymore. And I get up in the morning, COVID wiped my brain out. I had it over a year and a half ago, I think. And I got to where I can't remember things. I think when I go to bed, oh, I need to write that. And if I don't make a note, the next morning I think, well, what was that I was thinking about? Um, but this book is like the old passenger train. It's all the stuff we grew up with. And that's why it sells out all the time. And um, like I say, my teachers were saying, you'll never be a writer because you can't spell. Well, I, they're all dead now, but I've written over 20 books. <laughs> and I wish I could tell them, but maybe they're watching. But they're probably saying, oh, good God, she's still using that bad grammar. Well, I do it on purpose, you know. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> okay, this is my most requested poem. And I did put it to uh, to the background. You got Number it? Six. Number six. Okay. I don't know what's wrong with it. What's doing? Is that you, Mama, that just put a hand to my brow? When I couldn't work things out, was that you that showed me how? Is that you, Mama, that just turned on? I don't know what's wrong with it. What's wrong with it? You always had one on to keep me safe at night. Mama, was that you by the stove cooking beans and cornbread? And was that you during the night standing watch beside my bed? Is that you, Mama, that knocked that old bumblebee away? And you that called me in to supper when I came in today? I know I felt you kiss my name when I bumped it on the chair. And Mama, when I knelt to pray, was that you listening there? Is that you, Mama, or is that you? Did God let you come home to me? Or maybe you never left. I was just too blind to see. Or was it I felt so bad today and you knew I needed you and God let you visit for just a day or two? Well, Mama, I'm okay now. You tell the Lord I said hi. Mama, that you that just kiss me and Well. up when I hear, I mean, you know, I, people just eat it up I, um, because, you see, they relate to it. Um, and, and that's what I try to write. I'm going to read you one out of here, um, the auction. Oh, my gosh. You go to an auction, it's sad. They're selling your belongings, you belong to your grandparents and things. I think, how can they do that? Um, like I said, this is the kind of the light in the kitchen window. That That's what's in here, this kind of a thing. Going, going, gone, and the gavel hit the board. People fill the yard to see what they could afford. The rusty old dinner bell that could hardly be picked up is now riding in the back of someone's pickup truck. The china with 
the little flower is carefully hand-painted on, is wrapped in old newspapers and headed for its new home. A plow from the field will become a mailbox. An oak leaf butter mold just came on the auction block. The trunk and its belongings are being rummaged through, finding yellow torn photographs and a worn out baby shoe. An oval field cold table radio that busted light, busted tail light, dial light, came reading one. That brought in the grand old Opry tweak on Saturday night is not going for much, just what's in someone's pocket. But the bidding's going high for a gold-shaped golden locket. Things we all loved yesterday, things we grew up on, are souvenirs from the home place and are going, going, gone. <laughs> how many times have you been to an auction you think, how in the world can they sell, you know, their mom and daddy's and grandparents' things? I don't even go to one because I get too sad. Um, this is called the garden snake. This one's not sentimental. I love to write sentimental, though, because, hell, that's what sells. Excuse me, that language. But, but you know, that the people, they don't want to have to think and think, oh, my God, I've got to go look that word up. You know, but they want you to touch their heart. And, and, and if you do, you, they'll buy the books. And if you're going to make a living, you've got to sell the books. Now, some people, you know, they they sell books, but they work too. He's raised his hand over there. <laughs> see, we fuss. We used to fuss old. We don't fuss too much because we don't see as much as much. But we got old, you know. But I I love Jeff and and um, and his work. Um, he, I I read it a lot on on the internet when I or the Facebook. Uh, and and I I'm on Facebook every Tuesday with a poem that that I've written. A friend of mine records it every every uh, Tuesday. And I'm gonna tell you, it's it's incredible. I was on the American Pickers about a year and a half ago, and I did part of "Is That You, Mama?" Honey, this is the honest to God's truth. Now I'm not bragging. They have come from every state to my house because of is that you man I've got to come I've got to come and meet you I've got to have that book and they'll buy ten at a time sometime to give away you know and and they go through my house and they sit and talk to me and they cry men honey that weigh 300 pounds sit there and ball you know and I mean it touches them if you if you touch them that they'll They'll support you. And uh, I tell poets that all the time. And I never turn anyone away. I have people come in who, who are 75, 80 years old, and they've written about their family, and I never criticize them or anything. Or I say, you know what you need to do? You need to put you a little book together, go to the printers, uh, Kinko or somewhere, put your poems in there, bind them up, Show them to your family and show them to your friends at church and all your good friends and your relatives, and you sell them or give them away if you want to. But I said, you'll sell them. I never turn anyone, I never say, oh, that's not, you're not a poet or you're no good. There's no such thing as a bad poet, in my opinion, um, as long as they're trying and, and, and you'd be surprised. Then I've got some that are unbelievable, they're wonderful, that come to my home. And I'll say, oh, my God, you need to do something with your poetry. I don't know if you know K.B. Ballantyne or not. Uh, you know you, you know her. Well, K.B. comes to my house a lot. She lives in Chattanooga. And she'll come to see what I've done lately or just come to visit me. And uh, she not long ago, she brought in her last book that she'd just written. And she had a line, one line, and she brought the last word of that sentence down to the empty next line with the white space, just that one word on that white space there. And I said, KB, why did you bring that one word down when you had plenty of room to put it on the line that you was writing about? And she looked at me and she says, Maggie, I write for the eye, you write for the ear. I'd give anything if I could write for the ear. And um, that that was 
probably the biggest compliment I've ever had. You know, I mean, she to she recognized that it's the ear to me that's important, and that's back to country music. This is called the garden snake. I'm hissed. There I was minding my own business in a garden where some storyteller put words in my mouth and directed them to a naked woman. Then some artist wrapped me around a tree where the storyteller didn't recognize the fruit and called it the fruit of knowledge. I've never associated fruit with being smart, much less metaphor. I'm hissed. I got punished. The storyteller said I had legs and they were taken away so I had to sliver around the rest of my life. If I had legs, then I lost them to evolution, not punishment. But no, I had to go to the corner of religion because someone needed a scape snake. I'm hissed. Why couldn't a storyteller have picked an owl? An owl lives in a tree, and the owl is the wise one, not me. But the owl doesn't give a hoot about talking to a naked woman, and neither do I. But there I was, I'm really hissed about. The story goes on, and I got the blame for the fall of man when women told him to eat the fruit, and they finally recognized they were naked and got all sexually aroused and had two sons, but one killed the other after they got thrown out of what was a story called Eden, and who and who and who would name these two people Adam and Eve so some fundamental preacher could someday call them Adam and Steve. Good grief, all I did was lie around in the sun when someone used me to scare the hell out of people. Maybe that's why if you step on me, I'll bite you. I used to be sweet, but someone hissed me off. Oh, yes, someone also put words in God's mouth that God is forgiven. I ain't. I'm still hissed off. So, you know, I like to write just tongue-in-cheek stuff. And um, that this is out of the box, um, which is kind of stuff like that. And I, I can write some serious stuff. Got one here about Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King, um, uh, Ty, Tyree Guyton, who's a great um, artist out of Detroit, does graffiti. Um, but then sometimes um, I'll, I'll write something like The Garden Snake. Bill Morris came, I, I'm sure you know Bill Morris, came to Guff, um, Bell Buckle several years ago and looked me up and wanted to meet me. And uh, I was at home when they called me and said, Bill Morris is down here wanting to meet you. And I thought, Bill Morris is wanting to meet me? I mean, he's intellectual, you know. And so I was sitting there, and I didn't even comb my hair. I, didn't, I just ran out the door to meet him. And we sat down on a bench in front of a store there in Bell Buckle. If you've ever been to Bell Buckle, please come and see us. It's, it's real laid back. And I read him poetry. He wanted to hear my poetry. And he sat there, and, and um, I had written a poem about Maya Angelou. Uh, years ago, he filmed her going back to Stamps, Arkansas, where she was from. And he said to me, you know, Maggie, um, I I filmed uh, Maya Angelou one time. You remind me so much of her. And I said, just a minute. And I turned to my page and read him that poem about him going, and he couldn't believe it. I mean, he just, and this huge crowd gathered, not because of me, but because of him. I mean, they were, a lot of tourists come to Bell Buckle. I mean, it was, they were just everywhere and uh, listening. And it, what a day it was. And years, a couple years later, I was invited to Maya Angelou's house. And she wouldn't be called Love, Man, Love. she didn't want to be to Lou. And um, we were at the dinner table having lunch. And uh, she said something about being uh, on Bill's show. I said, just a minute just like I did him, and I turned and I wrote, read the poem about her, and she just went crazy over it, you know. Um, not bragging, but, I mean, when you get Bill Moyers and people like Maya Angelou saying, man, you're a writer, that, that makes you kind of feel, backs you up, like, well, maybe I can write a little bit, you know. And um, this this is the, um, well, this 
poem got the picture where it, it, you can't read the last two lines, so I'm going to read it. But it's about um, uh, watching that show. Um, I don't know. I just uh, I just write. It usually starts. It starts two ways. It starts in the heart, goes to the brain. And I write it, and then it goes back to the heart and see if it works. Or it uh, starts in the brain and goes to the heart and back to the brain to see it work. It depends on the depth of the poem, what I'm writing. If it's a memory, man, it's heart. It, it just, it's all heart, you know. If it's brain, then it's got a few more words in it and metaphors type of thing. I mean, I was writing metaphors before I even knew what they were. Um, so, I mean, the poets that read today, I love their work. You know, um, you understood it. If I can't understand it, I don't fool much with it. Uh, but um, uh, he's great. <laughs> but he uses some big words. I have to run look them up. And I don't like to have to look up anything, you know. Uh, I want to understand it right there. Um, so I don't know. I just, I started out in country music and it's in my poetry. Those images of growing up. Um, and it's been successful for me. I've made a living doing this. And um, people think of they turn it, some of them turn their nose up at me, but I don't give a hoot. But you know what I do when I write? A lot of times I speak with these real intellectual poets, and um, they, when I start mine, is that you, mom, and stuff like that, they throw up. They puke. They think it's so bad. But you know, time to sign books. There's three in their line, and everybody else is in my line. And I just reach over and I say, you write something about your mama, you might sell a few books. I don't take take any crap from anybody. You know, I believe in my writing. It's been successful for me. I've been Port Lord for 27 years. I have tried and tried to give it up, but people wouldn't let me say, Maggie, you're our voice. We were going to change it about uh, two years ago. We, had, we were going to meet and pick a new port. Um, and they asked me for some recommendations, and I put old Jeff down there, you know. Um, I thought, well, he's a friend, and he's a great poet. And I also put some other poets. I had about five on that, three to five. When COVID hit, they were going to give me a retirement party, invite everybody there at the big banquet hall in Bell Buckle when the COVID hit, and it went on hold. And we haven't done anything since then. I keep calling Tennessee Art, uh, the humanities. We got to get a new poet, you know. And they need to do that, and they wanted me to help. And um, like I say, when the COVID hit, that ended that, and I've had it. But I've had it too way too long. But every time I tried to give it up, people say, you can't. You're our poet. We understand you. And... Um, I don't know. Like I say, Hank Williams Sr., honey, was a poet. Country music's poetry. The way they can turn a phrase um, and the way they can describe something. You see what they're saying. Anybody got a question you want to ask me or anything? Anybody? Have I upset anybody? <laughs> Have I upset you, Jeff? Because I love Jeff. Jeff's a great writer. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Well, thank you. Um, uh, she's, uh, did y'all hear the path that I've taken and what's possible? Well, believe in yourself. That is the main thing. Don't let anybody put you down. I don't care if you're intellectual or kind of like me, an old country poet. Whatever, don't let anyone make fun of you. You just keep writing. Y'all are great writers. You know, um, imagery, that's what's important. That's why country music is so great today. 
Um, and it has been, well, not to, today. They say the same words over and over and over. But used to, oh, Lord. Um, the, the, like I said, that song I was a, always so easy to find an unhappy woman till I started looking for mine. Now, what does that say? He was married to a woman that was unhappy with him, see? And um, the, the the country music is incredible. The the way they can turn a phrase and the metaphors they use. Hank Williams was full of them. Uh, did you ever see a robin weep when leaves begin to die? You see, you see that robin, and you see that those leaves turning. Uh, the silence of a falling star lights up a purple sky. The great speckled bird, uh, Roy cuffed it. Lord have mercy. Out. I don't know, maybe y'all remember that. It was one of his first big, big hits. And um, it, people went nuts. And I don't know, just the way country music says things. Uh, um, Carl Butler did, uh, if you don't want change your way of living, you'll get honky-tonk-itis in your soul. Honky-tonk-itis, what a word. I mean, that's the way they did things. Yeah. Okay, I know my time's up. Kristen's pointing to her watch. You know, y'all probably thinking, oh, God, I wish she'd shut up. But, uh, you know, I just, when I get off on country music, honey, I can talk a month. I love y'all. Please come to Bell Buckle and see me. You're welcome in my home at any time. It's always open to everybody. And sometimes I'll have 10 or 15 people at one time in my home. We have to sit on the floor and everything. But they come from all over the United States. Only because I read, is it part of that, is that you, Mama, on the pickers? And they come because they said, got to have that book. Got to meet you. So um, um, come see me. Yeah. Okay. I didn't understand what you said, darling. I'm always happy and jovial. Jovial. Yeah, joy. Well, because I'm an idiot. I mean, you know, I find humor in everything. I go to funerals and laugh. You know, uh, if you don't laugh in life, you don't have a life. I've always laughed. My mother laughed. And although we had such hard times, Mom found the humor in everything. And um, let me tell you one more story. Have I got time for one more story? Oh, I was in my teens, and I was uh, listening to country music on the radio. And I thought, I looked at my watch, and I thought, oh, my gosh, Mom will be home any minute, and the dishes from breakfast are still in the sink. And um, I, in the meantime, I had written a poem about a beggar coming to the back door for food. You don't see that much anymore. But in the 50s and things, beggar and 40s, they were coming around needing food. And they always came to the back door. So uh, I wrote this poem, and I had him all visualized. His clothes, everything in the poem, you know. And I thought, i got to get those dishes done. So I'm in there, and I'm washing dishes, when all of a sudden there's a knock on the back door. And I went, and there stood a beggar, exactly the image of the beggar I had written, clothes and everything. I was like, oh, my Lord. <laughs> Honey, I cleaned out the refrigerator, and we were poor. I fed him and fed him and fed him, honey. He was sick, throwing up by the time he left. I just kept shoving it in him. And... um I said, I said, I had three dollars in my pocket, and I pulled out that three dollars, and I said, "Here, this. I want you to have this three dollars because you got to have supper. Because in the fifties, that would have bought you supper." And he said, "Ma'am, I don't need your money. I needed you." And he went, well, "Oh, I'm crying, you know. I mean, and I just written this poem about Jesus coming to the back door needing money, and it was him. I'm convinced that was the Lord." And I fed him, honey. He went to, back to heaven full, full, you know. But things like that happen to me all the time. I get signs all the time in my life. And I don't know what it is, but you got to open your heart to them. 
Um, but I'll never forget that incident. Uh, uh, he, that beggar, and it, it was same clothes and everything I'd visualized. So you, you never know when the Lord's going to come see you and feed him. Be sure and feed him. Okay? And just remember that. That's important. If he's on earth, he eats. <laughs> Come see me, okay? Thank you so much. All right, I appreciate it. If you've got any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Uh, anybody? Yeah. So, yeah, see, I really like Well, and I'm a nut. Uh, well, you've got to be a nut if you're trying to make a living at this. But I did it, and so I'm a happy nut. I've always been nuts. And uh, so here's the award for Maggie. Oh, my Lord. Uh, I'm getting an award? Yeah. Whew. Well, thank Dr. you. Dr. Isaline Lifetime Excellence Award. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is beautiful. Thank you so much. Uh, I love writing songs. Uh, I still write them. Um and and um, Loretta and I write a lot together. Um, I don't know. I just songwriting is in me. Country music is in me. And um, I don't know. I've just been writing them all my life. All those tearjerkers, honey. You'd think I'd had a bad life, but I've had a good life. 